What do you think is the most important thing about a church? If you've ever been church shopping, if you've ever been interested in church, you're probably looking for a place where the people are friendly. You might be looking for a place where people seem to be interested in the community. You might be looking for a place where you come away once you've been there with a sense of encouragement. How many of you would say that when you think about church, the thing that matters most to you is whether or not you end up in heaven as a consequence? And if that is something that you, you, you know about, but it probably hasn't been your highest priority, when you think about all of the different denominations that exist, would you say that what really distinguishes them is just style or is what distinguishes them ultimately something that can make an eternal difference as to whether an individual dies and has a happy eternity or dies and does not have a happy eternity. I think there's a, a part of each of us, and especially in the society and age in which we live, which is really, really hesitant to suggest that there could be something that's serious involved in distinguishing different proposed paths to heaven. And yet, when the Apostle Paul speaks to his friends, um, he, he doesn't back away at all from talking about something that is really, really, really important in understanding why it matters, what kind of teaching is being received by God's people. So, what's the issue here? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul talks about the man of sin. And the larger context was that the Thessalonians thought the end of the world had already come. Someone had, had lied to them about this, and Paul wants to say, no, it hasn't come yet. There's something that needs to be uh, revealed. A man of sin, his power is already at work, but he hasn't been fully revealed. The time will come when he will be revealed, and the Lord will overthrow him by the breath of his mouth, and in the end, he will be destroyed, this man of sin. Um, not, not presuming um, inevitably a single single individual, but but perhaps even an institution or an office or something of the sort that was going to seek to undermine, well, what? Like, how, how can you identify who the man of sin is? Now, this is a, a big enough topic that it's worth a ton more time. And I think to get us on a good start with this, what maybe is most important for now is to understand what is at the heart of what the man of sin is trying to do. The man of sin or this office or this institution ultimately keeps people from being saved. Listen to this. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So the effect of this is that people aren't saved. Now what has the power to keep people from being saved? Well, if they are told that salvation comes as a consequence of their human actions, if they are told that salvation is some sort of a partnership effort where Jesus does something but then the human being must contribute something else, where the impression is given that, that perhaps God gives you some kind of energy or power, but then ultimately your salvation depends on what you do with that. What if someone is told or given the impression that, that you do your best and God will do the rest? What if you know, some of those thoughts may seem very similar to what is a very common theology that is promoted in our own day? Again, there's much more that can be said about this and about the specific application of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But what would be very helpful for you and me to consider today is, am I placing my confidence for eternal salvation on something that I am doing or something that God has completely done for me? If I place my confidence on something that I am doing, even in the smallest degree, how can I ever be sure that I have done enough? But if I know 
that my salvation has been completely won for me by Jesus. That whatever it is, it is grace, that means undeserved love, that means God doing everything, everything. I know that blows your mind. It blows my mind. If we were to look at salvation as something similar to a resurrection, where after someone is raised from the dead, would they say, well, you know, I, I heard Jesus speak my name and um, I thought about whether or not I would come to life again. And, you know, after I thought about it, I thought, sure, I'll, I'll welcome Jesus into my life. I'll, I'll come to life. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Whatever salvation is, it is a resurrection. And whenever you hear something being taught in the name of God that suggests that salvation is something other than that, then you know that it is not from the Lord, that is from an enemy. And the Apostle Paul wants God's people to be protected from the enemies.